G'day everyone, how are you going? I got asked to do a video on sample uh, proportions, which for methods is the last topic we approach. Now, those doing spec make the distinction between sample proportions and sample means. Sample means is in spec, sample proportions is in methods. A lot of the thinking and the knowledge is the same, but make sure you understand the questions and what you're doing so that you get the right formulas at the right time. I've got all this up here so that I can kind of run through a whole lot of things to do with sample proportions. Well, first of all, what is a proportion? Well, that's just the number of people who exhibit a certain characteristic divided by the total number that you survey. All right? And stepping back a little bit further, let's talk about surveys and census. When you want to do a census, that means that you are going to ask every single person in the population a particular question. Australia does that every four or five years. It's time consuming, uh, it, it is expensive, it takes a long time to trawl through the data, so we don't tend to do them very often. What we tend to do is a sample of the population and then from that sample we make predictions about the population. It's much cheaper, it's much quicker, it's much more responsive, there's a lot of benefits to it. But there's always a bit of risk in doing that, and that's what we get to in the next section. There's always a bit of risk about your predictions about the population. Because we didn't sample it, so we don't know. So we're making predictions about the population. Let's get into the early work here. Let's talk about sample proportions. Let's talk about left-handers in the world. Now, I'm a right-hander, so I'm, I'm the superior being, so to speak. Apologies if you're a left-hander. Blame your parents, not me. Uh, how many left-handers are there out in the world? Well, I could make a guess and say, I don't know, 10%, 20%, 30%, I don't really know. All right? But I could do a sample of a group of people and then from that sample make a prediction about the population. All right? So that's the idea. Keep that in our mind. Now, you wouldn't normally know the proportion of success and failure here of left-hander yes, right-hander no, or vice versa. So we're working this one through with the idea that we know that the left-handers make up 25% of the population. Now I'll show you later that we wouldn't actually know that and how do we figure that out. But if we were to do this with a spinner, and let's say I did 50 samples, and in each of those samples I did 20 trials. So think about this in another way. Let's suggest that I have 50 people in my class, and I send them all out tonight, and I say, I want you to ask 20 people each how many, uh, if you are a left-hander. And then you record that number. Let's say one person went on out, they asked 20 people, and four people said, yes, I'm a left-hander. So that would mean four out of 20, or in that case, uh, what's that, 0.2 of the people are left-handers. So the proportion of left-handers in that sample would be 0.2. Let's say someone else went out and they asked people and they ended up with eight people. Well, eight people, eight out of 20, would make 0.4. So the proportion of left-handers in that sample would be 0.4. Now, you can see how proportion and probability, it's the same calculation. We're going to use them slightly differently, though. So, success failure. Now, those two examples that I had, 0.4 and 0.2, neither of them are the 0.25 that in this case, with this scenario, this simulation, I know the probability or the proportion should be 0.25. But my two samples were different, 0.2 and 0.4. If I kept doing these samples, gathering the information, I'd get 0.25 and 0.3 and 0.35 and another 0.2 and another 0.4. I'd get a range of answers. And from that range of answers, I would get a graph that would be looking like this. Okay. Now, hopefully, and this should be the case, if this was true, then hopefully the middle right here would be 0.25. That would be 0.25. There would be some samples. Like I said, my first sample was 0.2. Well, that might be sitting here. And I might even get another sample that would be 0.15 down here. So I would get a multitude of samples coming back of various different proportions. But what we tend to find is when we do a large number of samples, we tend to find that the, they will approximate normal distribution. And that's kind of handy for us. That's going to be handy. 
So recap here first. We've got a yes, no, so we're talking binomial, right? Binomial, yes, no. And we tend to see that they fit this normal distribution curve. Now that's a benefit for two reasons, two major reasons. One is that the middle of these samples, the middle of these samples will tend to approximate the actual proportion in the population. Think about that. From the samples that I've got, I tend to find, or not tend to, I do find, that the mean position of all of these samples under this normal distribution approximates the actual population proportion. Now because of that, central limit theorem, CLT central limit theorem, says as we increase the number of samples that we do, the, uh, the sample proportion, that's what the little hat is, the sample proportion will approximate or approach the population proportion. Now that's really important because what that means, I can go out and do all these surveys and when I get them all back and collate those numbers, the mean of the sample proportions I can use as my population proportion. Okay, So I don't know the whole population. I can't sample it. It's too much, too hard, too expensive. But if I go and do some samples based on this idea, I can then know that my sample proportions, the mean of my sample proportions, is a very, very, very good estimate of the population proportion. Now, a couple of points on that. One is, you've got to make sure when you're doing these samples, that they are fair samples. Let me give you an example. If I want to know how many people in, the, in Australia, in Perth, are over two metres tall, right? If I went and started doing some surveys at the State Volleyball Centre or the State Basketball Centre, then my, my data is probably going to be skewed because to play basketball, play volleyball, most people are taller. Okay. Similarly, if I went to some, some area where I thought that there would be shorter people around, then obviously that's going to be unfair. So I would need to go to a neutral location. I might go downtown here, stop on down the corner, and as people walk by, I don't know who's walking on by. As they walk on by, I just record over, under, under, and I just record their height. I don't know who's coming along. It's completely unbiased. But I wouldn't go and stand out in front of the basketball centre and do it there. That's probably going to be an unfair and it'll be biased. So assuming that I do my sampling well, which was the previous chapter that we did, then this will happen. This will happen. Now, the other part about this, the standard deviation of my samples, right? I've got to work a little bit there. So I'm going to rub this off because I need a bit of space. Rewind if I need this bit again. What I'm going to do now is, if you remember, when we were doing standard deviation of binomial, standard deviation of binomial, didn't we use this formula? Hopefully you remember this formula for the standard deviation of a binomial distribution. All right? Well, remember now we're doing proportions, aren't we? We're not talking about the actual numbers. We're doing proportions. So if I want to convert this number, whatever that is, into a proportion, don't I have to divide by the number of samples that I'm working with? That would make sense. That's how we get it into a proportion. Now watch this. I want to get that guy under that square root sign. So what I need to do is this. If I extend that square root sign here, putting him underneath, I would have to make that a square. Because it's divided by n, but if I make it n squared and put it inside the square root sign, the squared and the square root cancel out. <coughs> and then that allows me to cancel that one and that one. And hopefully now you can see I've got that formula there. So it's just an adjustment of the binomial distribution formula. And it, I can use that because it was a yes-no question. It was binomial. Okay? So that's how we get this one here. So I can now work out the standard deviation and the mean of the population based on the data that I have. All right? Now, key question, but we don't know the population, sorry, the proportion for the population. 
Well, no, we don't. But as I said, that's the whole idea of understanding where all this comes from. Okay? So why do we want to know the standard deviation for the population? Well, that allows us to make predictions about the population and where things are likely to fall. Don't want to jump into the next video yet, but that'll be part two talking about confidence intervals when we use this information here and we actually make predictions about the population or where the population is likely to be. All right? Watch for part two in a minute. Hope this one's helped. There's a lot in this. There's a lot of thinking, a lot of understanding. The calculations are quite simple, quite simple. I've got worked answers for 6A and 6B of Sadler's book. Um, if you're using that book and you want a copy of it, email me, I'll flick them straight on back to you so that you can uh, work through them with those work dances, which I think help to understand what you need to do. Hopefully this has helped guys, catch you later.